Good afternoon Philippines, uh, maayong hapon, wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh sa ating mga kababayang muslim and to all our viewers from all over the world, thank you for joining us today to learn more about the importance of big data for campaign communications and strategies. The official campaign season for those running for president, vice president, senator and party list representatives just started yesterday, but we have been inundated with campaign slogans and campaign messages for months already. Some have also used this loophole in the COMLEC rules as a time to dry run or pretest their candidates' branding to see how it will stick. But are there other tools other than the political survey that can be used to calibrate the game plan? Welcome to the seventh installment of the National Forum on Communication and Democracy Philippine Elections 2022. Data sentiment or data and sentiment analysis going beyond surveys. My name is Ed Lingao, a journalist with TV5, and I will serve as your host and moderator for today's program, which may also be, be viewed via live streaming on YouTube at the TVUP channel, as well as on the TVUP and the Philippines Communication Society Facebook pages. We will also have some live tweeting, so please use the hashtag PCS Forum Series with your posts. And now, before we begin, we let us acknowledge the following. We would like to thank the University of the Philippines system or the UP system, the Office of the Vice President for Public Affairs. Of course, the Philippines Communication Society, the UP Information Technology Development Center, the ITDC, TVUP, the Internet Television Network of the University of the Philippines, and everybody who has helped to make this forum series possible. And because we have a lot of faculty and students watching us today, PCS members will be receiving a certificate of attendance as a benefit of their PCS membership. Ayan po, uh, you will see on your screen yung uh, certificate of attendance. Uh, ano po, inaabangan po talaga yan. So uh, kung gusto nyo makakuha po niyan uh, and you're a, PCS members, uh, you're, you're a PCS member, please do stay for the duration of the forum. And you will get this personalized certificate of attendance. Now, if you have not yet applied for or renewed your membership as of yet, this is your chance to be part of the premier organization that represents the communication discipline to the Philippine Social Science Council. The online membership form is available on the PCS website, philscomsoc.org slash membership. Again, it's philscomsoc.org slash membership as well you can see on your uh, on your screens the qr code that you can just scan for uh, an easy application to membership to the pcs and because this is also a national forum on communication and democracy we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard so please take note we will be using mentimeter so that our viewers on Facebook and YouTube will also be able to participate. And it's also a chance for you to be interactive during this forum. So, hindi lang po kayo makikinig. Kung magtatanong, meron din kayong question and answer dito sa Mentimeter. Do not worry. This is not going to be right minus wrong. Hindi po graded recitation ito. We encourage everybody to participate in our mini quiz. I know that sends shivers to the spines. Pero madali lang po ito at sumali na po kayo. Nandiyan po yung QR code on your screens. Your answers will be discussed during our panel discussion later on. And you'll also see how the other viewers have answered. Okay, yan po ang QR code na nga Mentimeter. It's uh, in menti.com with the code 6082-1993. Now again, for, our, for all our viewers, including those on Facebook and YouTube, please open your browser and go to menti.com. And fill in nga itong menti code na nakikita ninyo. It's 6082-1992. Or just scan the QR code on your screen. Madali lang po yan. Just open your scanners on your cell phones. Okay, I know that everybody is excited to get the show going. So to set the tone of uh, data and sentiment analysis going beyond surveys, let's hear a few words from the Dean of the College of Mass Communication in the University of the Philippines in Diliman, Dr. Arminda V. Santiago. Amari. Hi. Hi, Ed. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, introduction. And uh, good morning, a pleasant uh, morning to everyone. 
And uh, wait, there's something going on in my screen. I just have to get rid of it. All right. So uh, anyhow, um, and I hope that everybody is having a COVID-19 safe day and everybody's fine and healthy. So uh, I would like to welcome you to this very timely and relevant um, webinar entitled Data Sentiment and, uh, and Se Data and Sentiment Analytics Going Beyond the Surveys. I posit the first question, what is data analysis? And the second question, what is data analytics? Is there a difference? These two phrases are used in describing how information or data is examined and also um, processed, okay? So that uh, it can be used for whatever purpose you want to use in your uh, study. And uh, there are occasions and many times that uh, these uh, phrases are used and understood loosely, but they are similar, but not really different. They both refer to an examination of information. In analysis, the researcher interprets the information, gathers it, and forms a coherent understanding and drafts a narrative plan. And then analytics is in the hardware aspect, what a computer is doing when it accepts, stores, calculates, and makes resulting information available for use. I don't know what's happening with my uh, with my screen. Okay. So, um, but then essentially we have to look into really what is the difference. You know? So, uh, analytics is understood as the overarching science of managing data. However, analysis looks at the more micro aspect of data and then uh, actually uh, it will uh, you know uh, it will be used for, for interpretive purposes for a particular goal in a study okay so then uh, essentially also it is uh, but then uh, both of them are similar in scope how about sentiment okay sentiment is an attitude towards something and most of the time, yes, it is a subjective, as in the video where, uh, where uh, Dr. Lisa Bersales talked about what sentiment is all about. Okay? And, uh, but in sentiment, unlike in what data, uh, the concept of data that we are uh, familiar with, sentiment carries a social and cultural dimension because it comes with a combination of beliefs and emotions that explains an action. And many times sentiment is expressed with an underpinning of social values. So for instance, an example of sentiment is someone being so patriotic that they decorate their house with many flags of their countries. But then the basic question, can we measure sentiment? Because for the longest time, um, Sentiment is not given a lot of importance, but now, yes, it does have importance, especially when we use social media. At first glance, we dismiss sentiment, but nevertheless, even if it is hard to define, it is very measurable. With today's webinar title, Data and Sentiment Analytics, I see a mixed methods approach, a harmony between quantitative approaches and that of data analytics and a qualitative approach, that of sentiment analysis. If you are, you know, uh, in, the, in the know, okay, or in the hub of information, actually, um, there are many um, softwares and approaches so that you can analyze sentiment. So like, for instance, there is Arcanium, and then there is a this latest one that's being promoted uh, on Facebook, uh, Brand24. So, uh, because in sentiment analysis, you are mining opinion. And mine because sentiment data can be large and overwhelming. When you look at it in the context of analytics, it, it can generate big data. And, you know, it can overwhelm uh, even the best uh, researcher or statistician. And then um, sometimes uh, 
they, they use a variety of methods like uh, natural language processing, text analysis, computational linguistics, biometrics, okay, and a lot of other methods. And um, sentiment analysis has been used uh, for the longest time because it's used in business. Okay, it is uh, widely applied to voice of customer materials, such as reviews, survey responses, online and social media, healthcare materials, and a lot of things. So that sentiment analysis and sentiment analytics can be applied to studying the sentiment of voters for this year's elections. And then, of course, how do we manage sentiment no, in the context of sentiment analyti analytics. So it's really no different from data analytics, okay? There are many softwares and programs that you can use to extract sentiment, just like when you want to extract uh, data. Then um, essentially, yes, data and sentiment analytics is a powerful tool for a candidate. However, we should be aware that this is a forecasting tool and forecast can change in a breeze. Additionally, it can enhance your capacity to analyze audience opinions, but then opinions can change, especially when election day is nearing. So what can sentiment analysis analytics give you? You can find out positive, negative, and neutral mentions about yourself as a candidate or as or also about your competitors you can protect your reputation you can find negative comments and communicate these with their authors or sources before they turn into a pr crisis okay so like right now um the the managers of our uh candidates uh they are really on their toes because uh they have to weigh whether or not they will, uh, you know, communicate with the opposition okay, about whatever uh, negative comments that they generate, if, uh, if ever they prove that they are the ones generated, generating it. And then, of course, you can find insights. Then you can improve your public exposure. This is why sentiment analytics is uh, important. Now, this is an exciting webinar. Okay? I can't also wait. To, to hear from our experts. It can be an eye opener when you learn the ins and outs of data and sentiment analytics. Do not allow yourselves to be limited or pushed to a corner by surveys. There is really more to what the eye can see. So let us all learn from our experts for today. And thank you very much and welcome to this uh, webinar on data and data and sentiment analytics. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your very inspiring message, Dean Army Santiago of uh, the UP College of Mass Communications. Uh, again, uh, harmonizing quantitative and qualitative approaches to big data and uh, big data as a powerful tool for just about everybody, including the candidates that can be used and that could be useful. Uh, but before we forget, po, uh, uh, happy birthday nga po pala. <laughs> Baka lang di po ninyo alam, si uh, Ma'am Armin, nag-birthday lamang, so yung pansit po, eh, abangan po natin maya maya lamang. <laughs> Virtual pansit. <laughs> okay, it's time now for our mini quiz. Uh, again, like I always like to say, uh, do not worry, this is not right point of song, this is not a graded exam. So <laughs> it's just our way of uh, getting the no, getting uh, getting your perspectives on the uh, on the topic at hand. You may now start answering the Mentimeter poll on your screen. Simply go to menti.com and fill in the Menti code 6082-1993. Yan po, 6082-1993. It's, it's, uh, no, uh, it's not a complicated uh, process po. Uh, we just basically ask you certain questions and then you answer and then we will show you in real time the results of your answers on the screen. So, Look at it as, a, as parang a, a mini poll of sorts. So just to show you, uh, uh, our first question would be, what are the words that you associate with big data? Uh, I'm assuming po that you've already uh, opened the Mentimeter app. Uh, and the first question is that, <clears throat> what are the words that you associate with big data? 
So for this first question, you may put in three words for our word cloud. Uh, yan po yung nakikita niyo sa inyong screen. Ang word cloud po, simple lang yan. Uh, the, the answer that generates the most uh, votes or responses, yun po yung pinakamalaki yung font na makikita niyo dun sa ating word cloud. So the bigger the font, the more people voted on that answer. You will see that the words, of course, now will increase in size the more times that it is mentioned by our viewers in the Mentimeter poll. So, for example, lang po, uh, the one you see now, parang ang pinakamalaki dyan is the word analysis or that or your surveillance data of uh, Facebook and statistics. So, the bigger the font, uh, the, more, uh, the, more, the more votes uh, that phrase or that word uh, got in our Mentimeter poll for number one. I think, Paul, are, are we seeing the answers coming in already? Yeah, I think we are seeing the answers already coming in. Pero pa ho kayo but if you want to change, if you want, if you want to change uh, the outcome, you can still change the outcome depending on how you vote. Uh, okay, so we will leave the Mentimeter poll open for you as we go along with the program. I-reveal lang po natin yan later on, uh, yung mga kasagutan uh, later on in the program with our speakers. There will be two questions po, ah. That was the first question. In what are the words that you associate with big, with big, uh, with big data? The second question po is this. Simple nga, uh, oo, hindi. Malalaman ba ang kabuang sentimiento ng mga botante mula sa political surveys lamang? Oo, oo, hindi. Will you be able to divine the full sentiments of the voters just based on political surveys? Oo, oo, hindi. Again, po, using the same application, um, uh, depending on your answers, you will see in real time the results on your screen. So far, meron po tayong 49 people saying hindi malaman ng kabuang sentimento ng mga botante mula sa mga political surveys lamang. Oh, but, but nabawasan. Nagdagdag bawas. <laughs> now it's 51. <laughs> Baka may nagbago ng isip. 52. At ang nagsasabi po na oo ay lima lamang. Oo, malalaman ang kabuang sentimiento ng mga botante mula sa mga political surveys lamang. So yun po. Uh, again, we will keep on coming back to uh, to the Mentimeter screen every once in a while to check on uh, viewer sentiments on those two questions. Now, as we are hearing from our viewers, let us now hear the word on the street with the person on the street interview uh, via TV, UP. Data po, it focuses on quantitative, so numbers. Siya yung nag-generalize ng um, opinion or ng pulso ng sagot sa isang tanda. Big data is any data which is fast, which has lots of information, and which is uh, accessible. Uh, to many in real time. Using this vast amount of data, they will be able to analyze and create patterns para ma-predict or mas mapag-aralan ng mabuti kung ano yung magiging result or kung paano yung magiging handling nila sa election. Tingin ko ang big data pwedeng magamit sa election pero basically kasi sa, ang big data ginagamit talaga for, for ano eh for uh, data gathering ng, ng any any source of information. No? Surveys, on the other hand, although now we do online, will be more structured and with more identified uh, respondents. Um, a part of me naniniwala sa surveys using that vast amount of information kasi it is a scientific process and it's from material uh, and concrete data. Me personally, hindi ako naniniwala sa surveys kasi I think um, maraming falseness na nakatago sa likod ng bawat survey na nilalabas. Pwede naman pagbasya ng survey kasi ginagamit naman yan talaga para ma maalaman mo ang pulso ng tao. A sentiment analysis finding out what, what do they feel, what are their sentiments, what they what do they want to say? Yung sentiments naman po ito siguro yung, yung mga, um, mga tanong na kumukuha sa emotional na, na background. Uh, 
bata or ng kanilang sa loob. Uh, this coming election, so I hope na yung, yung paggamit ng technology tulad ng big data, huwag naman magamit sa masama. We should use our critical thinking for the benefit of the people and for the sake of truth and justice. Okay, maraming salamat to uh, TVUP for giving us the pulse of the people through this person on the street interview. And to start off, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel of experts for a roundtable discussion on data and sentiment analysis going beyond surveys. We are, of course, proud to have with us this morning the founder and managing director of StatBase Group. He is also the president of StatBase ADR Institute, also a favorite guest of the Chiefs on One News. Please welcome to the webinar, Professor Victor Andes or Dindo Manhit. Prof, uh, Prof Dindo, thank you for joining us. Hi, Ed, and uh, good afternoon to everyone who is participating in this uh, webinar conference. Thank you for the invitation uh, for the, from the Philippines Communication Society. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, and next, we are pleased uh, with us on the panel, Rappler's head of uh, or for digital strategy. In this capacity, she leads strategic initiatives and content data partnerships, uh, as well as in risk management on tech platforms. Among these initiatives is Rappler's multi-pronged efforts to address disinformation online, which tie together big data-supported research, fact-checking, and civic engagement. So please welcome to your screens, Gemma Bagayawa Mendoza. Gemma, thank you for joining us. Um. Thank you for inviting me, um, PCS, and um, also thank you, Ed. Okay, rounding up the panel, a privilege with us, political columnist, economist, and businessman. Uh, he writes, of course, for Business World and the Philippine Star. Please give a virtual welcome to Andrew Masigan. Hi, Ed, and uh, hello to everybody. Good afternoon to PCS and the faculty that's present today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Nice, sir. Suki rin namin yan sa, sa programa namin. <laughs> well, thank you, for, thank you to everyone for being a part of this roundtable discussion on the importance of big data in crafting and refining campaign communications and strategies. Okay, let's start off with a person on the street interview that we just watched. Uh, uh, may I ask for some uh, feedback from our speakers? Uh, you saw the video, you heard the opinions, you heard some believers, and you, you heard some unbelievers. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think of what uh, the public had to say? Uh, let me start with Dindo. Prof. Dindo. My approach in any political communication initiative is always ask myself, who am I trying to talk to? So the first step is trying to understand the voters. No? So when you understand the voters, the best way to understand the voters is through qualitative and quantitative data gathering. That's why I've been always a subscriber of data-driven analysis. I try to understand who they are, their geographic and demographic profile. I try to understand issues that is important to them. And I even probe further by doing that qualitative. So a quantitative and a qualitative is something that I try to, to work with. Then came the reality you know, that in this postmodern world that we are in, data is can be mined on you know, data, especially with the rise of social media platforms. So I try to merge that because reality is also in any campaigns, you cannot do what I call blanket communication or shotgun approach. It needs to be targeted. And to be targeted is to understand, you know, you're not expected, especially in the Philippine political setting, you're not expected to win even a majority of plurality can win it. But the best is understand where your possible voters are and how can you best communicate to them by understanding who they are. That's why I call it a voter-centered campaign. And I build on that using data. And, I'll, and I would argue here, every campaign uses surveys. Uses surveys. Okay, So anyone who tells you that they're part of a campaign and they never use surveys or even qualitative FGD, he has never been part of any campaign, but they will not admit it, that they're trying to understand the voters. It's the analysis where it matters. How do you best interpret the data? Mm -hmm. And then with that, Ed. Okay. Sisili pa rin talaga, kahit sinasabing hindi kami tumitingin sa surveys, sisili pa rin talaga yan. Oh, yeah. Oh, Gemma, what do you think? Yeah, so um, 
I'm, I'm going to speak from the perspective of a, of a journalist that's looking at this space and looking at this exercise, yung election exercise. And as I was saying earlier, Ed, during our chat, um, it's impossible to really think of elections without like, thinking of data because the surveys themselves, that's data still. Um, election results are, uh, are data. The results of previous elections, uh, we know that our analysts, they look at that as reference to understand the voters. But um, basically, a lot shifted with the digital space. And when I was listening to the people who were interviewed earlier, um, I, I think there's a, a, we need to know once what that big data is. So essentially, we're now living in a space that in on um, um, big part of the, ano, big part of the ecosystem. I mean, elections are, ano eh, are in effect, in effect kasi hearts and minds, eh, but battle yan for hearts and yeah. minds. And and uh, where is that battle being waged? You sh- in the past, that battle was being waged in the traditional media. Uh, well, it still is to a large extent, but um, increasingly that's happening now in the digital space. Now, um, as a journalist, I like to look at that and essentially like um, looking at that space and how that space has changed so that space is different very different because um in the past um you're you're basically but the measurements are different the 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 surveys are how you get the sentiment of the voters the the another the the actual viewership in inputs the back the signals uh where they're getting the messages that's measured differently but now all of that can actually be measured because of digital you know um how people are consuming information those are logged in the digital digital media and that can be crunched and that can be used to manage m- mitigate you know, message like uh change messaging or even craft messaging so th- it's very important to watch that space during elections yeah uh, but mind you ano Pa-warm up pa lang to ah baka masyado kayo no. <laughs> Pa-warm up lang to. Wala pa nga tayo sa question number 1 eh. But uh, uh let me go to Andrew. Andrew, uh, what do you think? Warm up lang ha. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think uh data analytics is both a boon and a bane. Okay? okay. The reality is that the reality is that data analytics can be frightfully accurate. It could be used uh, uh by certain people. Well, for one, it's a boon because it gives us the real picture or a, uh, a close enough picture of what the sentiments really are out there. No? But on the other hand, it gives uh, the players in, in the arena the opportunity create, to create realities. And these realities may not be accurate realities. These may be realities based on half-truths, based on disinformation or, or out, outright lies. No? So at the end of the day, even if we have um, a picture of what the sentiment is out there, it is still incumbent upon the voting public to do their homework and to really know and dig what the truth is and get to know the candidates well. Because uh, uh, like I said, no, um, the, the truth can be manufactured. And yeah. the basis of all that is the, uh, the sentiments derived from analytics. Yeah, yeah. A very interesting point there, and also I, I suppose that also raises the question of whether uh, whether the public should be swayed by uh, by sentiments uh, or should they be by their own uh, analysis of what's happening around them. Uh, whether surveys sway people and should they be swaying people? But anyway, uh, before I get ahead of the before I get ahead of everybody else, <laughs> okay. Uh, let me begin with the first question. Uh, Dino, I'll go back to you. Uh, what is the definition? How do we define big data? Uh, what are the sources of big data, and what are the best examples of how these are used for campaigns? I think big data. The use of big data was actually introduced where, with 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 the rise of the use of internet in campaigning. So at the turn of uh, it's early 2000, we saw that in Western democracies, whereby it was initially meant before the rise of social media as a tool. It replaced what we used to call in in traditional campaigning the mailing system. So that you receive a mail, uh, literally a mail from your postman. You know, candidates used to send that. You know. So it, the internet, the email address became a tool to communicate direct to voters. 
specifically targeted. Then as mm-hmm. social media evolved, especially Facebook, in the US you can add Twitter and maybe YouTube even. It's a, it was a way to target your message going beyond mainstream media. That means you don't need to pass through the editorial control, the, or the biases of TV network, broadcast networks. No? So it was met straight. So very critical to this is it became what we call a direct to voter approach. So how do you, how would you understand where that voter are? The mm-hmm. data mining happens. So, at the, but the problem is you be, you might be violating privacy laws. In the U.S., when this was first used, there was, uh, I think there was still no regulatory uh, policy with regards to data privacy. You know? So it was, they were able to use uh, extracting from marketing campaigns you know, and really identify where these voters are. But in the Philippines, the reality is you don't need to really break it down because the key demographic here is social class D. I've always argued that. You know? These are people that tend to shift the vote. And surveys, qualitative, uh, qu- uh, quantitative surveys, and even qualitative studies will tell you that when they, when they fa- look for the respondents. So that is where data mining is. Mm-hmm. It's how you analyze and identify where these people are. Then you build a campaign to communicate mm-hmm. to these people. Mm-hmm. That's the value of data mining in political communication. You can target uh, You can target your audience. You can fine-tune your message depending yes. on Based on what they want. So people don't even know that, wow, galing naman ni candidate A. Itong inahanap ko eh. Nila alam, inaral pala sila. <laughs> oh, that's what, and it's no different from how campaign advertising has evolved. Diba? Inaaral muna ang butante vis-a-vis the candidate. Then, they, then the campaign team or the campaign advertising team creates that ad. But data mining brings it to a higher level, specific targeting. Because advertising is now what we call blanket. Diba? Tamaan natin kung sino ang nanonood ng TV show na to. Ngayon it reaches you because of social media. And it yeah. becomes a powerful tool, not only for elections, but for any policy initiative or advocacy that, that, that any political group would like to do in any society today. And not just in politics, I suppose also in, you know, in, uh, in, in commerce. Uh, yes. Selling goods, so whether they're politicians or, or, or uh, sabong panlaba. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, true. I, I taught a course uh, in political marketing as an elective course, but I took it from the marketing, the business marketing principles. So basically, it's just that in this case, you're not selling panglaba, you're selling a person and you're talking to a voter. So it's, it's, that's where the demographics might change. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I have to move on. Uh, <laughs> Gemma, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, data mining and, and big data, diba? So um, I... I, I, I look at it, so there are two things that you can, uh, no, you, you, we, we, we need to think about. First, um, because of social media, um, everybody, in effect, became a publisher. No? I mean, like anybody with a Facebook or YouTube account and anybody can create one, they can create content, they can push content out there, and that's data. Every piece of content out there is data. Um, and, and you generally uh, publish that to various audiences some of that is public like public posts diba? which can really reach a big audience then at the same time there's also behavioral data that can be used to you know create a model of you diba? and and that data is actually the one that's more invasive so in the past with i was saying um in the past with traditional media you you don't know what you actually read who actually read um, this piece, diba? or 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 like this piece, diba? yeah. but now it's not. I, 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 we, you know, diba? I mean, the the companies know. They know what 
uh, which ones read, which uh, which uh, which content was read by whom and when, and and um, they know when um, some somebody reacted a certain way. Like even the amount of time it takes for that person to react to something, that's not that's something that is collected. So that data is um is used, diba? I, I mean, by the companies to trigger responses from from people, and generally it's. Uh, a response to get you liking more, right? So there's that. But there's also the public data na ano to, na that, 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 that is used to call sentiment. So um, meaning like when you post something, you hate somebody, then uh, there are techniques for uh, for collecting that and for new, uh, for deriving insight from that. So that's also another, ano to, na it's both good and bad. I, I, at the end of the day, technology is a tool, di ba? But yeah. but um uh, increasingly the problem really is because of the profit motivation diba? because it's used to it's not even just the ano yan, the groups that are uh, participating in this space in the campaign space diba? the platforms themselves become in a way participants in the whole process because of the way the platforms are designed diba? so if you like more a particular person or uh, engage more with a, part, a, a set of people who are posting about a particular party likely more more likely you will get more of that so you get a different view of reality from others diba? so those are the implications of data and data gathering that is a, a, that needs to be of particular interest to everybody because my, it, it all of that has influence in the election outcomes uh-huh. Gemma, let, let me you know, let, let me ask you mm-hmm. something that uh, Andrew uh, brought in Karina, the idea that uh, you know mm-hmm. it's both a boon and a bane uh, mm-hmm. uh, and you you're you're echoing that and you're you're amplifying that mm-hmm. that issue but, uh, I, I, that doesn't this uh, uh, you did mention it's a tool lang uh, but doesn't this mm-hmm. make you feel like you're being manipulated <laughs> is there any is there any reason so, to be concerned mm-hmm. So it, it, the, 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 the data mining and all that, uh, oh no. <laughs> the dangers really is in the fact that you don't really know. So anybody can create an account for one thing, the right? So technically, that that space can be people, or can be other like can be ano can be not people, but um you know just uh sub puppets you know be, uh, like puppets that are like accounts that are created and but actually manipulated or managed by a single person so multiple ano to marami yan diba? that that is being done and and or there might be bots uh, that were used to create that so the 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 thing there is that um uh, do people even know that something that is posted by somebody uh, by an account was posted by by a real person so there that's there's that first another the like how do you distinguish the other part is is the content itself correct diba? is it verified right and and we see quite a lot of that that's the rise of disinformation that's the rise of what we call fake news and that is being used to manipulate now um as you get more of that like you 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 get ano you you get fooled by a particular uh particular claim or an auto narrative you get deeper because of your behavior on social media you might actually be getting deeper and deeper into that whole thing and and you don't know if you're if you're not aware you don't know so get, so that's the danger getting deeper into the rabbit hole kumbaga <laughs> yes <laughs> so that's the danger and 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 that can be used that can be misused mm-hmm. Andrew, let me bring you in. Teka, you mentioned Karina, Andrew, uh, Andrew Basiga, na, na, you know, it's becoming frightfully accurate. Uh, I, I find that interesting that you you used the, the phrase of frightfully accurate and and accuracy normally being uh, used in a in a positive way, but it's becoming frightfully accurate and it's both a boon and a bane. Taking off from all the discussions so far, parang parang uh, yeah, um, at what point should we say that? Uh, at what point should we say that that's enough uh, data mining? Uh, you're you're mining too much data from the viewers, the listeners, the the, the watchers, the participants on Facebook or social media or whatever. Uh, looking at what we read, uh, what we browse, and all that, uh, and feeding us more of what uh, you you think we want. Uh, uh, well, basic question. Is this something to be concerned about or is this something to work on and how do we work on that? 
Well, I say uh, frightfully accurate because our margin of error is less than 2%. That's why whatever the data shows, uh, you can at about 98 plus percent uh, accuracy. But Ed, just to just a caveat now, I'm not a data scientist. I'm not a data analyst. I'm here to talk about the platforms of the presidentials. Okay, so uh, just we'll just get that out of the way so that people know what uh, what my track or what my role here really is. No, but having said that, um, uh, I think that uh, it's become. Uh, social media and the campaigning over social media has become so prevalent and become the main source of information, especially as Dindo said, the, the majority of our market are of the D socioeconomic class. And when you talk about the D, uh, D class, those are households with incomes of 20,000 to about 40,000, 44,000 uh, pesos a month no? for a family of five. So the, these are the people who uh, we're talking about, okay? And uh, the data further shows that 86% of this voting universe have not uh, exceeded high school uh, high school level in terms of education. So you can imagine how, uh, how impressionable uh, this chunk of voters are, okay? And I think to a, to a great degree, data analytics is being used and abused and bended and um, manipulated in order to pander to this uh, to this voting uh, voting block by means of half truths and lies. No, so again, I I would like to I would like to say that social media only says one uh, aspect or one uh, one part of the story, but really we have to rely also on debates, on interviews, on the website itself and study the material. What is the social economic plans of these candidates? Because at the end of the day, okay, the social economic plan is a social pact. Those, yes. the social economic plan are the package of promises and the package, the package of commitments, no? So it's incumbent upon us to really look at that uh, and not be dissuaded by, uh, you know, promises on the internet are cheap. You know, anyone can make a promise, no? And uh, it, it it, the promise or the tweet or whatever can be taken down the, the day after, no? So there is an element of due diligence that is incumbent on every voter. So awesome. I'll be happy to talk about their plans and programs later on. Yeah, but but, but Andrew, uh, you, you make a very good point there that uh, people should be looking at plans, programs, and platforms uh, and, and not just be swayed by, you know, not just be swayed by uh, uh, whatever you call it, whether it's it's uh, it's sentiments, uh, and in uh, popular support for which or whichever candidate or, or what, uh, but but let me ask you that to straight out. They, they, uh, to, uh, it looks like to a great degree. It looks like to a great degree. Uh, the, the, the 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 ratings are being driven more by the second than the first. I mean, yes, uh, that's that's very obvious because um, because at the end of the day, and Dindo will probably validate this. It is really share of eyeballs and share of mind. Uh, that wins the day of public opinion. And the leading candidate has an overwhelming, well, uh, yeah, is way above, no? In, in terms of uh, share, share of mind and share of eyeballs and as far as the internet is concerned uh, and social media. But Ed, may I make a point, no? May I make a point? I think we should give value to the written word. Why? Because one candidate may have an extraordinary platform but may not be able to articulate it as well as the next candidate, okay? So That's the written right. word matters because this is a social pact, right? Um, I'd like to draw attention to, uh, to Ping Lakson, for instance, no? Uh, we've seen him in several campaign uh, discourses. We've seen him in KBP, we've seen him in, uh, we've seen him um, uh, with Jessica Soho. And let's, let's, uh, let, I, I just, I'm just singling him out as an example, no? Because he may not be the most fiery or articulate person. And mind you, I'm I'm not vote, I'm not campaigning for anyone. I'm just stating a fact, okay? He may not be the most articulate, he may he may not be the most animated, but uh, there is substance to what he's saying, okay? And I uh, do your due, I did my due diligence, went to his website, and it is a very impressive platform. So that's what I'm saying, right? The the uh, the theatrics and the, the, and the social, yeah the social media noise are only one aspect of the uh, equation. 
it's really the written word. Mm-hmm. Actually, I, I completely agree with you. And I think everybody agrees with you. <laughs> but but that, that also leaves us in a conundrum. Eh? Uh, uh, at this particular point, uh, how many people bother to read? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the yeah that 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 is the challenge, no? That is the challenge that we're facing at the moment. Okay, well, we'll, we'll circle back to that. Sure, <laughs> that's, sure. Some, that's something that uh, I'm sure everybody uh, agonizes over every night. Uh, I do that every night as well. Okay, uh, well. Uh, Nasa first question pa lang po tayo about the internet natin. Sorry, medyo, medyo napapahaba yung pintuan. Pero ito po, what are the implications of uh, big data companies collecting, analyzing, and using data to influence uh, political opinion? In, in a way, we've already touched on this, eh, pero I'd like to I'd like to mind your thoughts further on this. Uh, yung yung uh, collection, analyzing, and uh, using the data to influence uh, political opinion for good or for bad, uh, Maybe a boon, maybe a bane. Uh, what can you say about this? Uh, and uh, uh, or maybe moving things forward, uh, what should we do about this? If anything should be done at all, Dindo, I'll, I'll go back to you, Dindo. It's a uh, as long as it does not violate our data privacy law, because that is what's good with us. We, the U.S. did not have that when they were data mining. So we had this law. I think what middle 2013. 2014, if I remember it right. So how can we use the data privacy law to regulate these companies? Because it allows consent. Yeah. If you if you allow consent, there's no problem. But when you don't know that you are being mined. But of course, with Facebook, the moment you become a member, I think there's that note there that uh, mm. they own whatever you post there. No, that people yeah. did not. Did not realize that. I think even with you too, when you so so the mere fact that you wanted to be part of their platform, you gave that consent, and that's a reality. That you thought it was free, engaging with your friends without realizing that the business side of it is understanding you. Uh, yes. Uh, but I've tried to raise that uh, with some of the representatives of some of these companies because these are corporate entities at the end. They're denying that now since I think the fiasco. So I really wouldn't know uh, that they are using those date, their data mining for, for this purpose because it became uh, scandalous after the 2016 multiple elections around the world. <laughs> yeah. Not only in the US, but in Europe, people were at, during the Brexit, here in, here in the Philippines. Because one of the companies that was data mining the Philippines and using it for a campaign, it's called Strategic Communication Laboratories, suddenly removed the Philippines as one of their successful campaigns when those scandals happened in 2016. So I don't know if anyone will admit. Because right now, you have to have to give your consent. Yes, sir. Philippine laws. Yes, sir. Pero sir, hindi ba, ano, uh, hindi ba automatic na itong data mining? I mean, uh, the, fact that, uh, the fact that Facebook gives you what it thinks you like, to read and what you like the algorithms to yeah the uh, algorithm yeah but you know, it's meant for you ang, ang worry ko sa data mining is when it's being used by somebody else yes, to capture you mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. that's the danger of data mining but right now the algorithms tells you your likes uh, gives you some feeds you know? so that's where the challenge is Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but is there a line to be drawn somewhere? I mean, is it just simply uh, um... stay, stay out of social media? That's the only way. But will you? Ed, <laughs> uh, Ed if, if I can interject, Ed. <laughs> yes, Andrew. Uh, you know, to be fair to the likes of Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, they never said that they were the gate, gatekeepers of truth. As a matter of fact, they went on record to say, we are a technology company that is profit driven. In other words, their aim is to generate ads for to give their stakeholders or their stockholders uh, share value. No, uh, they never said they were the gatekeepers of the truth. So again, as, as Dindo said, it's incumbent on us to do our homework and, and discern which, which to believe or which not to. No, um, I think the problem is escalated to such a point wherein it is all disinformation. I'm talking about disinformation and weaponizing the internet has, has um, 
uh, escalated to such a point that it dictates governments, it dictates world order, it dictates national security. So just in the same way after World War II, the, the United Nations was convened to, um, to establish protocols for national security, sovereign domain and all that. I think at some point uh, we must, uh, or the international community must come together to establish protocols for disinformation because it could really make or break societies. Mm -hmm. Pero sir, wouldn't that be a tricky? Uh, uh, wouldn't be a, that that be a tricky and sticky question of determining to begin with uh, what is what is disinformation and what is not? I mean, uh, I, I'd like to think that we all agree uh, that uh, disinformation is bad. Disinformation is bad. But uh, then you have people who will know uh, who will uh, who will uh, look at the nitty gritty and say that uh, that's uh, that's not disinformation. That's my opinion. Uh, and so on like. As a journalist, I, I have to make a distinction eh? because I get so much information on a weekly basis. I must make a distinction as to what is verifiable truth, in yes. other words, backed by statistics, or what is an opinion. Those are two different things, no? So uh, just in, in the same way that national, yeah, national, security, sure, national security issues were vague in, the, in 1943 to 1945, just before World War II, the same way we have to define what is this information and what what is lies what is opinion and what is verifiable truth so mm -hmm. i think that that day uh i think will come sooner than later yeah but also the the other sticky uh, question is uh how far do you go in going after misinformation some people may may say that might say that uh, you know it's my right to believe in 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 what is wrong uh i have a right to be wrong in other words you know? Uh, mm. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's also that's also freedom of expression if i if i post something on on social media i'm being the devil's advocate here of course sure, sure, <laughs> if, sure. I, if yeah. i post something on social media and i believe in this uh who are you to stop me or who are you to to clamp down on me well of course it is a private uh it is a private medium yeah. so so there, but, uh, it, Ed, uh, with, with your point no, it's your right to post that, no? but when it's an organized effort, mm. for me, that is, that's where the difference is. Yes, when you yes, have yes. suddenly showbiz personality showing political inclination, common social media influencers who did not view or who did not exist before 2015, 2016, suddenly becoming political analysts without even... Sorry to say, Ed, but mainstream media checking their background mm. and giving them prominence. No, so then you have, and, and you can track it. That when you they come out with something, and you could see that a, an organized support in comments, in sharing, you know, it's a that is what we should be wary of because that means they are, it's an organized communication to push a certain agenda. In this case, this information, as Andrew said. You can check facts. You can you can have data to support it. Yeah, that's and, why it's and, good to have fact checking. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm gonna jump in there uh, because we're talking about fact checking. So, um, every so yes, uh, everyone has the right to free expression. But I want to distinguish two things. Like you are you have the right to air your opinion. Yes, but um, the you you are not uh, no. Not, Hindi right. It's not a right. the 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 platform. The broadcast itself, the bro uh, is is not a right. In having a platform is not a right. Not everybody has the right to be like broadcasted to millions. And and that's the reason why in in the past, diba, with traditional media, what happened was that um, traditional media. Uh, was supposed to be vetted and it's not always good at vetting yes there <laughs> there are times when we 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 you know air um people that who should not be you know, who should be fact check on on in the airwaves but at the same time there is some you know, that there there's a process there when we when we select um when when there's a selection and who's who you actually interview and 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 uh, when somebody has been repeatedly lying, most likely, like there's a there's a not like there's a consequence there. But what I I would go into this like first um facts 
are not ano I mean there are verifiable facts there they, yes. there ano to opinion yes. <laughs> opinion is different like um just because um uh you said in your opinion the sun is shining doesn't mean the sun is shining diba it's you can go out there you can actually verify if the sun the sun is out there that's a real fact or if you say that something happened um at this time at this place that something actually happened right it doesn't mean like the holocaust happened right um and 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 that's not under debate so so those things are 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 not matters of opinion now um the problem right now is there is no gatekeeping at all there's no verification at all what happens is that everybody basically you have a space that's really you know diversified the sources of content the sources of information and and information content contains narratives messaging that influence voters that could influence voters so that's really very important and and that's a big ano part of this yung the the um i i want to show ed something that we've found from our research if you don't mind um just to show you how exactly what is the actual impact of that so in the past you you can see that in in the past we have the traditional media you know where the sources are you you may not always agree with them but but you know who they are you can at least criticize them and and, help, and hold them accountable you know? um but now uh, with the social media space the sources of information are actually so dispersed now we compared the newsrooms for instance the uh, newsrooms on digital the, they they're the red dots in that scatter plot and they're so um drowned by the noise out there and the noise includes the brands the noise includes everybody else who is on on who is on facebook um and has a page and what does that mean um it, it you might actually be having um like mainstream media organizations or already policing themselves but everybody else is not bound by that and therefore could be affecting public opinion so i mean from a from a monitoring standpoint if you're not monitoring that you you may come to the point when people vote and you don't know what happened right because you are not seeing how that's moving so so in a way the 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 use of data for monitoring by journalists is very useful and very important very important to the coverage but at the same time um the other part of that is that uh, the other consequence of that is this in effect um because um you divorced the gatekeeping role from sorry i'm just unshare it how do i know uh, Sorry, Be because you divorced the gatekeeping role from from the ano to, There's no more gatekeeping role to the ano, you, You're basically uh, removing responsibility, so you cannot. It, it's really hard to to hold parties accountable also in in that digital space. Now, platforms, in a way, they part as I mentioned, they participate in the space. Sometimes ano eh, they're not even ano eh, they're not even. Uh, the, the goal is just to ano, increase engagement but because uh, but because you are um you they're using that the, the, the algorithms are are clustering people according to what they see is the profile of this person then then in fact the the platforms themselves are actually recruiting for the candidates so that is a very important difference between this space and and the traditional media space yeah I'd, i'd like to go back to your uh, mm -hmm. your while ago uh, the green mm. this is facebook oh, sorry. Uh, that's facebook yeah so we look yeah. into we look into um pages public page uh, uh, pages on facebook um and that includes pages of news organizations but we also track a lot of other um uh, pages meme pages brand pages company pages other communities out there dog page uh, things like that and and they're all Uh, sending signals to the public to the general public so these are just the pages that does not in even include all the accounts we're talking here about th over 30,000 uh, pages and as you can see here um the the newsrooms um 
usually they're seen as the source of information. They're no longer the primary source. They're no longer the primary source. And then therefore, um, as we are um, communicating, we're trying to educate people or give, nuancing um, the conversations out there, you might actually have a, an al alternative universe where other things are being discussed and they have different realities. Yeah. And, and, so, and that's a very powerful thing. Tell, tell me if I'm getting this right. What you're showing in this in these images uh, mm -mm. is how uh, news is getting overwhelmed by all the by other... Everything, uh, all the other pages in Philippine yeah. social Philippine yeah. social media and yeah. Facebook. Yeah. To the green color being all the other data Everything or, else. Uh, on yeah. Facebook. The red, yung, yung, uh, mm -hmm. news, yes. So you still but, have very big news groups, but yeah. there are also small news groups and, and the, the audiences are different. Um, and, and all of that. So the, the thing that uh, social media empowers is very niche messaging. So it might be that um, for, for a candidate, for instance, um, one message might uh, be more powerful to a particular audience and that's delivered through another uh, information source. But um, for a different segment of the audience and we're not even talking abc here we're talking very targeted very niche markets something else might be effective right and and all of those messages are being tested all the time all of those messages are are, are being circulated sometimes we don't know what what are those messages that are being circulated so that's how different this space is now but uh, the, the green the green dots uh, th this is not qualitative in any way uh, this is quantitative this is um uh, page uh, likes uh, and interaction so we're talking here of reach of of yeah. the content of these uh, different uh late pages so, so it's not in fact well, no it's not in reference to whether or not it's information or disinformation it's just basically the others the other it's uh, basically other everything that you're seeing but at the same time you're seeing a big part of that also are, are are pages that are participating in that space and and one thing to take uh, to take into consideration is like for instance a lot of these might be celebrity pages but they're sometimes being they're often being used we've seen quite a lot of them that they're being used for campaigning um meme pages as well have been used for campaigning um History pages. So very recently, we've been tracking a number of history pages, supposedly um, that are uh, that are triggering posting things that are very nostalgic about the Philippines. But um, they've been using message. They've been uh, circulating messages that are favorable to a particular candidate. So so all of that are signals that the voters are receiving, messages that the voters are receiving, and that is affecting public opinion. But uh, Gemma, looking at this uh, this uh, this graph, uh, um, wouldn't the problem then lie on uh, on uh, on how uh, so much of the public has turned to Facebook uh, for? Yes. Their... Mm -mm. So part of it is like a significant part of the population now rely on Facebook for news. So but which actually, makes this <laughs> even more, I know. <laughs> including the journalists, I, I know. Including media workers, yeah. Mm -mm. But it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily a, a condemnation of Facebook and, and what it does. I mean, mm -mm. It, it, it's a networking We're just site. talking here about impact and, and the reach of the messages yeah. and, and how, like, what is actually reaching people. Yes. Well, interesting graphic. Uh, well, mm -hmm. Maybe we can, we can ask our, our other panelists to, uh, Sir, Sir Dindo, what do you think? Uh, I mean, you, you can see it, I think. Uh, but uh, what do you think of, uh, of uh, that uh, table? And what it means for us. On my end, uh, hard to comment. No? It's a uh, data that I'm not really familiar with. But uh, internally, in our own team in Stratface, we we do our own data analytics. And uh, I think it was mess. It was uh, mentioned in passing earlier by Andrew. The times the, the engagement. So when we've noticed that since the filing of candidacy, which was October. And our last read was January. We're trying to wait for the Feb for the end of January read. You see that Marcos has an average of 60% dominating social media discussions. No? So, and maybe it's a, it shows also in the in the survey. It, it was ranging 58 to 60, a little over 60%. That was 
October to December. So it just shows that and if you if if we will assume that he is pushing certain disinformation, as that has been argued by some, like he's the most qualified leader, he's the most pro-poor, Marcos was the uh, Marshall was the best years, legacy of Marcos was great. So imagine if he was dominating exchanges you know, across plat across different social media platforms, he's shaping the mind of voters. So everybody's playing a catch up. Uh, second to him, a uh, far second was Vice President Lenny Robredo at 28 to 30 percent in different uh, period of the past uh, month since October. So you see the, where the battle is. That's why I'm saying that this election will, will, will be shaped not by mainstream media, but it used to be because I, I remember they always say TV is king during election period. Now it's social media it seems to be the dominant uh, platform, especially with 89 Filipinos uh, in Facebook and YouTube. And that's very dangerous when there is disinformation happening. No? Uh, something that we had Pulse Asia read for us is what is the source of news? And last December, we got that one of our questions for Pulse Asia. So internet and social media has overtaken radio. So it's now second source of news. TV, of course, is still number one. But second is uh, internet. It crossed that. And cross it only from September, it was still radio. <laughs> but when it hit December, it was already internet. So you'd see so much movement in that uh, in one quarter alone, and you can expect more until the end of the election. It's being driven by the political campaigns. But, but let me interject that in there. Uh, yung PCAJ uh, finding was that uh, uh, Marcos did not well, technically, lang. Technically, <laughs> technically, he did not spend a peso on uh, Facebook ads. But that's a very technical thing. No. Eh? And, yeah, he did uh, not buy the ad. But what if it's ad. something something that we noticed is that social media influencers carry yes. Marcos. That was or, a, at, or at Tony Gonzaga projecting to be a showbiz personality who is actually now the MC of the campaign whose husband is the director of the ads. That means they're part of campaigns. Uh -huh. So it's not Marcos who's doing that. It was their production. Or what yeah. about... so? Or what about... This is the fascinating thing. Sick but fascinating. Facebook groups who had nothing to do with politics suddenly are all endorsing Marcos. Are you saying that these Facebook groups are being sold? Uh, or being bought? No? So that's what I'm saying. You cannot measure it. It's a different game. You cannot measure... It based on how many people paid for an ad in TV networks. Yeah, or even that measure has been rendered obsolete already. I mean, I remember when when, we, when I was at PCIJ, we'd look at that all the time. Eh? Uh, yes. And was uh, done for radio, TV, and social media. Mm -hmm. you know, what makes a successful campaign ad is when people think it's natural. Yes, authentic. And now it, it looks authentic. Marcos is not buying any spot. Mm -hmm. But your mm -hmm. our friend in TV Five before, who is a com who is some who is a commentator in what PTB Four is what with five ten million followers, you might know who I'm referring to. Sir, I will not comment. <laughs> <laughs> who is he endorsing? <laughs> Does he give it for free that endorsement? So that's a Facebook following of ten million between him and a brother. So just imagine who are those brothers. So that's what I'm saying. I, I refuse to incriminate myself. <laughs> yeah, but... I would add lang, uh, in relation to that, we, we're not even just talking about the current content. Okay? Kasi, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we're, we're not talking about share of voice for current. So here uh, at Rappler, we did this um, whole investigation into the, like, part, how are, like, the, the candid, the, ano, the pages or the groups that are, in a way, circulating messaging about particular politicians and and the Marcoses really have a significant uh, there are a significant number of social media influencers and pages that are posting content that are really favorable to the Marcoses and are and and significantly a, a big a, a large chunk of that include disinformation or hateful messaging so um one of the things like for instance that uh, that the the gold 
yung Italiano Gold. That's been in Facebook for years. Yeah. Like for years. We've, <laughs> years. Um, uh, Facebook and you, YouTube. The views, yes. Uh, and Mm-mm. people believe and people believe them. Um, the, the, the question about um, Nutriban, which was fact-checked again, I said, you know, I, I, we fact-checked this, this so many times already, that Nutriban claim. Um, that's been circulated forever. In, for, since uh, no, we've been tracking this, like 2014, Nakita, we, we saw that, that there's, there's this increase in the creation of groups that are like this, like um, history groups, um, pages of uh, pages that are, fav- are parang fan pages of the Marcoses. And then we're not even talking there of the ones that Dindo said where um, th- there are pages that, are, that used to be history pages, then they shifted. We, we tracked them, we saw them. So, so it, it's not about just advertising in a traditional way when the, 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 as, 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 as defined by Facebook, but it's the, it's the content, it's the native content that is actually more powerful. Mm-hmm. But, but let me ask you a question. Let, let me ask you uh, mm-hmm. the, of your, uh, this question. I, I want to know if there's any answer out there. I, I suppose in, in, uh, in uh, undertaking these strategies, uh, these candidates, especially the, the one that is leading right now, was able to or did his best to to to, to track uh, behaviors, sentiments, maybe maybe, maybe go through big data uh, to be able to come out with this strategy. I, I mean, uh, mm-hmm. parang of the other candidates, yes. parang they never bothered this kind of a strategy. For example, you <laughs> micro influencers and all that, di ba? Uh, from the from the traditional advertising, biglang napunta doon sa uh, vlogger na dating uh, dating life coach or vlogger na dating mm-hmm. ano musikero and so on down the line uh, uh, w- w- did we see a shift somewhere uh, and when was this uh, and all yes that? Uh, I can I, I've, I've tracked campaigns through the years it's one of my hobbies <laughs> so but what's unique with uh, with uh, Senator Marcos the son of the dictator. Can I say that? No, I guess uh, we were just playing with. Uh, is that he uses qualitative and quantitative. I, I know his poster personally. He started with me in Strathbury. He's a foreign poster. So his first operation in the Philippines was with me. So data is very important. So it's a very intelligent campaign. He was the one who helped him in 2010, helped him in 2016. So data is important. And understanding, but what was unique with them also is maybe they knew mainstream media cannot be a tool for shaping the narrative yes. for them. <laughs> so they found a way. So at the height when it so this was 2015, mm-hmm. they will not pass your standards uh, mm-hmm. or the standards of decent Filipinos. So they decided to circumvent it. Nearly made it in 2016 because, but there was a pushback. You know, you're fighting an administration machine also of President Aquino. We have to, that's not pure VP Lenny camp. That's Aquino administration machine that fought that victory of Marcos. So now, maybe the problem was while everybody was focused on Duterte and VP Lenny even was focused on her recount, Marcos was seeding this in social media. It, it did not stop. So, so it was... Then, is he really that popular? My, my point is, he's at 51, 52%, according to our data last December. He's not. He's popular because the supporters of Duterte and his supporters merged. If there was a Sara Duterte in the ticket, in the ballot now, he would be at maybe a tight second or a tight first with Sara, but their votes consolidated. That's why it looks strong. But the strength of that is both of them have strong social media machine. Yes. Marcos, we have tracked as 8.3 million fanatic followers who share, who comment. The Duterte have 26 million for the past five years. Imagine, imagine that forces uh, joining together. That's a powerful machine that nobody has seen. Something to think <laughs> Something to think about is this, like you, you're coming, you, you have a candidate 
or a family that has political baggage, di ba? And, and that's something that media, mainstream media, is not likely to forget. So I, I really agree with that idea. Na, like some, some of the ano, messages, and actually a lot of the messages that are being circulated, the narratives, would not pass um, master in, in, in terms of the, ano to, the editorial vetting process of mainstream media. But in, in social media... And and this is part of ano a technique uh, propaganda technique Ed, that um, the Russians actually used the the fire hose of falsehood technique. What is that? So you have it's multi-channel, it's repetitive. So messages are repeated over and over again. It's um uh, it lacks commitment, to objective reality, but that makes it ano more ano agile. Because uh, it just needs to respond to a message if regardless of whether that message is uh, the messaging is true or not it just you you just need to respond to the message so because of that it's very uh, all that combined is very effective uh, let me bring in andrew uh, andrew we we keep on going back to the idea that, that we want to talk about platforms you want to talk about the uh, positions you want to talk about policies uh will we ever get there uh <laughs> well you know what um actually we are there okay it's already in the public in public conversation and this is one thing that i'd like uh, to underscore and uh and uh, and really highlight no um uh candidate lenny has come up last december with her hand up boy salahat which i think is a it's a very well crafted uh, social economic plan in that it tackles the core problems of the country in one fell swoop. No? And the core problems, as you know, is poverty, joblessness, hunger, and income inequality. Uh, Isco has come up just last month with this 10-point uh, Bilis Kilos plan, which I mm -hmm. think is also very sensible. Okay, um, Although, if I may comment about, uh, uh, of course, all the plans have pros and cons, no? but yes. about Isco's plan, Isco's plan is really a spending plan. Okay. And, and uh, my question to East Coast Camp is, where the hell are we going to get the money, you know, now that our debt levels are 63% of GDP? So uh, for me, that's a festering question. I like Ping Lakson's um, <clears throat> approach to his so social economic plan uh, because he starts off with an internal cleansing, okay? He recognizes that the core problems of the country are, of course, the debt, debt levels, hunger and unemployment, and he attributes all that to corruption, okay? And from there, he springs off to other strategies. In other words, everything towards a clean and reliable and corrupt-free government is what Ping Lakson is all about. Yeah. Uh, Pacquiao's, Pacquiao's, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> Pacquiao has a very extensive one, 22 points. Uh, all mother statements, no details, so I can't really comment. No. Interestingly, Marcos has no social economic plan, not on his website, not on print media, not on any written narrative. So how he is at fifty percent uh, is really baffling, no? Because here he is without a plan, uh, lording it over the ratings. So that's something to think about. But Andrew, that, that's, that's precisely my question. Eh? Uh, will we ever get there? Uh, I ask that in the sense that uh, will we ever get, you know, will we ever get uh, to, 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 uh, to an elected official who, who, uh, yeah. who really has a plan? <laughs> well, well, you know, that's what the debates are for. That's why the debates, I mean, here and abroad, no? the debates are supposed to, uh, to uh, clear uncertainties, to make platforms known, to, uh, to eliminate gray areas. Um, but for some reason, uh, Marcos doesn't seem the need to, uh, to attend uh, these debates, perhaps because he thinks it will do more damage than good. I don't know. I'm just speculating. No? But, um, but that's, that's the reality. He's the man without the plan. Without the plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. We're going over time already. <laughs> I need to. I need to shift gears. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're now entertaining questions from our audience. Uh, from our audience in the Q and A session. Now for this section, we'll also be joined by uh, Dean Arminda V Santiago, Dean Army, who gave the opening remarks at the top of the program. Uh, but before we start reading off some of our viewers' questions, let's first share how our audience answered our fun quiz earlier with our Mentimeter poll results. 
Okay, and you can see, uh, yeah, on your screens, the uh, like we said, Karina, the bigger fonts reflect uh, the the words or the phrases that had the most votes. So analysis uh, is probably number one, as well as statistics, uh, followed by uh, surveillance data of FP. Talagang surveillance data of FP nilagay. <laughs> Information, numbers, privacy, and so on and so forth. If you want, you can screen grab this or you can capture this so you can uh, you can uh, look at uh, the results in more detail as we go along. So that's for uh, the first question of the Mentimeter poll results. Uh, do we have the results of the second uh, question already? Yeah, here we go. For the second question, malalaman ba ang kabuang sentimiento ng mga botante mula sa political surveys lamang 67% said, no, no, sorry, not percent, 67, 67 uh, voters said hindi, uh, 6 voters said oo. So correction, hindi po 67%, mapapagalit ako din doon yan. 67 voters hindi at uh, anim po ang um, oo. So marami sa kanila nagsasabi na hindi. Uh, hindi mo makuha yung kabuang sentimiento ng mga botante sa mga political surveys lamang. Okay, so uh, we see how most of our viewers have voted so far. We will go back to that uh, Mentimeter uh, data as we go along with the program. Um, uh, do we go into the Q&A? Do we uh, have... Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, sirs, uh, ma'am, meron ba kayong comments on the Mentimeter fun quiz uh, so far results uh, so far? Or should we go to the Q&A na? Kasi maraming mga tanong na lumalabas na sa Q&A. Baka gusto yung dumanetso doon. Siguro, let's go na to the Q&A para hindi tayo nagagahol sa oras. Uh, okay, uh, I'll uh, go into the Q&A now. Uh, from Nonoy Ativo. The DICT 2019 survey of internet availability pegs the Philippines uh, at only 12% of 42,046 barangays have quality internet access. Data says uh, 70 million Filipinos have internet access, uh, but that only counts accessing the internet in the past so many days. Data shows that there are is little quality and unknown regularity of a majority of Filipinos that are really online. How then can social media impact 20 elections given the low reach of internet in the Philippines? Uh, well, in, in quick, uh, we've, we've uh, heard time and again, uh, more and more Filipinos are online, but it appears that the internet access in terms of quality is not really that good. Kung hindi ganun kaganda yung quality ng internet access, could social media have an impact talaga on the elections given the poor yes. quality? Yes, yes sir. Imagine anyone in this webinar now, just look at your kasambahay, your employees, your staff who are class D. They were given social media access to prepaid cards. So this internet that is low, the reason why our internet is low is because so many users no? And uh, do you know that there was a study just published two weeks ago by We Are Social. Everybody follows this, who tries to understand. The Philippines is number two in the daily time spent using the internet. Oh, yes. <laughs> and that's not me. I'm quoting a data, an international data. So, basta mahili kasi tayo to comment how negative it is without realizing because we're all downloading YouTube there. We're all downloading. It's not the text anymore. That's why our our telco failed to adjust to the demand of this. No? But our urban area, just look at where Marcos is doing very well in surveys. He hit mm. 64% in Mega Manila. And Mega Manila is a ground zero of uh, internet use, no? or even urban areas. So I think we have to factor in that, uh, and as I've said, in terms of 89 million already, maybe these are fake accounts, but the very fact there's 89 million people sharing, you know, uh, text up, uh, responding. Uh, so it creates a certain momentum. And yeah. in a Pulse Asia survey, 57, 56% use the internet as a source of news. Of course, television is 92, but imagine radio at 39. So at times, maybe our government data is delayed in terms of accepting certain reality. So I, the telcos are big 
companies because they, they see that the rise of e-commerce, the rise of use of internet during the pandemic also. Okay. So we have to factor the, those realities. And also that gives a new meaning to the phrase big data. Download ka ng download ng video. Yes. <laughs> Malaki tuloy ang data. <laughs> okay, Gemma or uh, Andrew, uh, would you like to pitch in uh, dun sa tanong na yun? Um, with, the, with the quality of uh, internet uh, engagement so low, um, how big an impact could, 20, could uh, so- social media have on 2022? I think internet penetration, uh, well, Okay, uh, more than 75% of the population are in urban centers and internet is readily available in urban centers. So uh, for me, for me, it is accessible uh, to the greater majority, okay? And which is the reason why the penetration is, uh, I, I disagree that the penetration is low. As a matter of fact, I think, uh, I think on the wake uh, or on the back rather, of uh, free free data provided by the telcos, it's become accessible to the majority. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and siguro ano ano? Um, if uh, if uh, quality of engagement and quality of internet browsing is so low that that makes people more vulnerable to misinformation. <laughs> Click. But you also yeah. have to you have to also have to consider Ed that uh, the seeding of narratives uh, on the Marcos camp has started many many years ago as. Uh, someone someone mentioned as early as 2014, I think it was Gemma no? who mentioned as early as 2014, they've identified um, uh, m- the manipulation of narratives in history sites. No? So there you have it. Six years or maybe even seven years of, um, of brainwashing will really take its toll on, on public opinion. Actually, I'll, I'll go a little bit uh, further back. Uh, as far as early as 2011, 2012, uh, we were already we were already noticing uh, YouTube videos uh, retelling the Edsa narrative, uh, and these were yes. very very well produced videos. Uh, yes, videos. <laughs> well yes. researched. <laughs> May mga and, ano pa, mga archival and, content pa. Animation, uh, catchy tunes, catchy mm-hmm. sound bites, tapos and, uh, catchy. Sh- Ang galing na pagkakaluwa. It fits a short attention span also. Yes. Instead of watching documentary in TV networks, <laughs> being shown at 12 o'clock midnight or 10 o'clock midnight, this one targets a certain yeah. audience with with a few with a few set a uh, few minutes of a uh, narrative. Yeah. Ang, sir, sir, ang galing talaga pa kagawa. Ang sabi nga dati, ano, parang Angry Birds yung ano primary colors, <laughs> simple graphic film. <laughs> ang ganda, ang ganda. Ang, ang sarap panoorin. Oh. What resources can buy? nakakagigil yung yung content pero ang sarap ano rin but it, anyway. just, it also goes to show the i i what what's the word the um the uh can i use the word maliciousness of it all i mean from from uh from 11 years ago seeding the internet i mean this is this is a concerted effort designed to put us into this place this is all by design Okay, let's move on to Marami pa tayong tanong eh, sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to rush. Okay, are there remainders of the Cambridge Analytica strategies in our May 2022 elections? Coming from Invictus Buenaventura. Um, the, does anybody remember? <laughs> oh, of course, we, we all remember Cambridge Analytica, but I'm not uh, so so familiar anymore with the strategies that they, they proposed it. Does anybody want to comment on this? They use... Um... So they use a combination. They, they don't use behavioral data lang, but they also, they, they claim they have multiple data points. And, and that all of those data points combined, like I think thousands yung sinabi, in the case of the American voter, uh, ano to, that, that's used to, ano, to, to, target, ano, to target narratives, uh, particular messages to, to voters. Now, we know in the Philippines, um, of course, the Marcos camp denied this, but we know that they did reach out to, uh, no, to, to, to Cambridge Analytica. We don't know if they finally, uh, no, but uh, they, there's a, they, um, this was uh, no, I mentioned by one of the whistleblowers at uh, no, uh, one of the whistleblowers uh, of Cambridge Analytica. So, so we know that they reached out. Now, was that uh, no, consumed? Um, dinidina yon ng ano ng mga Marcos. But what we know is that um the election com- that this campaign itself is this the the seeding of these narratives 
it's very sophisticated very ano pre- pre- very precise very ano very niche so there are things that will appeal to more ano to more educated people and there are things that will target the target ano to ordinary citizen so obviously educated people probably will not believe to sa yung Italiano gold, right? Or ano, I mean, like, that's not gonna fly, right? But there are other messages like the the ano to, the nostalgia about martial law, the messaging about how how it would have been better, and so on. All of that, and and all of that, I I want to ano emphasize the point niche. It's really what's effective niche messages, not not very broad messages, but niche messages that are tailored to particular audiences. Targeted. Okay, that's okay. Yes. Uh, interesting question from Ann June Magnaye. How can we define political analyst? At sino ba yung mga matatawag na political analyst? Uh, uh, alam mo, that's a, that's a good question. Ha? Kasi even, in, even among us journalists and uh, in TV, uh, it's a question now. Eh. Sino bang analyst at sinong hindi? Uh, uh, at, at sinong dapat ituring na analyst? At sinong, sino ang, uh, ang man on the street, kumbaga? <laughs> Sino yung barbero? <laughs> I, I, I can answer. I'll try to answer that. No, uh, I would not like to be invited if I did not get trained 26 years as an associate professor in a university mm-hmm. teaching political marketing, electoral politics. That's why I call myself as an analyst. Even in the academy, we used to joke when some of our colleagues who are in political culture or misan, hindi pa nga into election suddenly comes out on TV. Or an international relations expert suddenly talking about elections. I, I used to joke, Ed, kung sino-sino na lang. No? But what's worse was after 2016, are the so-called social media influencing, influencers turning themselves into political analysts. Uh, and and that's, that's where the sad part is. And, I, I, and the funny thing is, I was questioned by one TV news director, with head of a Network said, problem ho kasi sa inyo, professor, masyada kayong academic. Kasi itong mga analysis na to, uh, maybe you know that news director, Ed, no? but... I uh, uh, will not uh, incriminate myself. <laughs> but sabi ko, uh, kaya kami analyst, may theoretical framework, may data. This one are basically propagandists that mm. you put on TV. Diba? So, yan ang problem. Sir, we, we've had a lot of discussion about this uh, 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 within our circle. Uh, I don't know about the other circles, but in our small circle, we made discussion to me about this. Eh. And our agreement was that, ano eh, uh, let's stop using the phrase political analyst. Let's just use the credentials. Yes. That's yes. the person that we are talking to. For example, uh, chairman, uh, political, political science department, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, diba? Or chairman... Yeah, that, uh, Thinking Pinoy. Kailan naman naging analyst si Thinking Pinoy? Mm. Diba? Or si uh, Sasa Sasnot. Diba? When, when, when do they become political analyst? Then they become quoted by people. Or, or, diba? or Trixie Cruz Angeles. Diba? I'm, a, I'm just naming some names na started coming out since 2016. Yeah. Kasi the, the phrase political analyst uh, is, is so widely used that uh, parang lahat ng, ng barbero ay analyst na. Yes. So our agreement among ourselves is ano eh, we just use the credentials yep. as, ano, as, as, a, as a better way to, identi- to identify an analyst without calling him an, an analyst. That way, Kasi you, some you, fun might, might not have the academic credentials but was part of a think tanks or civil society organization. But that's a credential. Okay. Yeah. So yung blogger became analyst because she has 50,000 followers that came out of nowhere <laughs> until 2016. Uh, hindi analyst yun, propagandist yun. Mm. Yeah, or civil society groups like uh, IPER, uh, the yes. Institute for Reforms, yung mga ganun. Uh, um, instead of saying political analyst, we just... Uh, Put uh, your title and your in your ano. Since, since you mentioned nga Iper, si Ramon Casiple, who's not an academic, but he's an active. Yeah. You know, people used media used to call him professor. Natatawa ako because he, he was a dropout because he was an activist. I like professor, nagi professor ka na. Eh, eh, he was a human rights activist, and you have to give credit to that kind of anal- analyst, ba? Yeah. Experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, as you mentioned, he was the executive director of IPER before he retired. Yeah. Ang tawag nga sa kanya malu eh, ano eh, pambansang chismoso. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> anyway, a question directed to Gemma from uh, Nonoy Ativo. Ma'am Gemma, I think he quotes you here. Eh. Does not have the right to broadcast one's opinions to millions, unquote. And uh, si Nonoy Ativo... Uh, asks, can I get more clarity on this? Is this the basis traditional media? Where did this come from? Thanks. Mm-hmm. So, freedom of expression, diba? Te- technically, you can you can speak out, like, but as a person, yung ano, yung sinasabi mo, what you say, can only be uh, ano, limited by ano, like your your audiences, diba? Now, the who had broadcast audience before that was like traditional media. Uh, those were the ano, publications, the radio stations, dati, ganon, diba? Now, um, ang, ang, ngayon, it's ano to, anybody has that broadcast capacity. So we, we even see quite a lot of these um, user accounts lang, pero like um, thousands of followers. Like one one particular ano, account, in fact, that we've been looking at because it's been um, used to, ano, it's been ano, targeting traditional media kasama kaya yata dun sa mga tinarget ed <laughs> in attack niya. Ano to, um, he has um, 180,000 followers. So, so yeah. that kind of following is almost like, um, I mean, like one of the ano, local media networks, not, local news organizations natin nasa sa probinsya. 20,000 followers lang yon pero they're expected to ano follow certain guidelines now ito wala diba so that power that power of broadcast is what i mean hindi siya it can be taken away diba in in traditional media ABS-CBN was ano was was not given a franchise supposedly supposedly because of certain violations etc right because we are held accountable right the, the air- privilege not a right yeah so oh, oh. That, that's i know that that can be taken away that that broadcast power can be taken away okay uh well uh i'm, I'm sorry we're uh, running over time again <laughs> so i have to catch up i have to play catch up again <laughs> we only have time for one last question so we'll make this a fast round for everybody also in the panel the question is do you think that big data will devalue political campaigning to mere algorithms or enhance it to be more responsive to the voting population? So, po, do you think that the big data will devalue uh, the idea of political campaigning? Algorithm lang ba yan, or will it make it more it, responsive? It, it will enhance uh, uh, any campaign to be more responsive. But what do we mean by responsive? To get the support of those voters. So they will have a better understanding and a better way to communicate by targeting a specific uh, demographics of voters. Hey, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Dean Army, Dean Army, baka, ano, you'd like to pitch in as well. Uh, the, that question, do you think that big data will devalue political campaigning to mere algorithms or enhance it to be more responsive to the voting population? Well, uh, algorithms are very useful. Um, anything that uh, you can uh, use to uh to to look at trends and to forecast uh, i i don't think that uh, it will uh, you know uh, it will fade uh, it's a very useful uh, instrument actually mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I suppose the question also wants to ask us ano eh, um, the potential for misuse eh? Uh, I think dun ang parang gustong direksyon ng tanong ng tanong as well. Eh. Could it be? Uh, I, we know that it can be used for ano for information for uh, educating people. But uh, what's the danger of big of big data as well being misused, uh, whether it's in politics or uh, for commercial purposes? I think the I, I algorithm. Think it, sorry, I think the, no, the algorithm l- lends itself to being misused. On a commercial, a political basis, or a commercial ba- a purpose, or a commercial purpose, political purpose, whatever, no. But uh, I'm waiting for the day when uh, an agency such as the Ad Board or the KBP, who uh, yeah. who, who who polices and, and gatekeeps the truth in as far as advertising is concerned, and as far as a network uh, network uh, content is concerned, uh, will adapt to will be adapted to uh, to social media. 
uh, until such time, the algorithm will work, uh, will become more and more efficient towards uh, controlling the hearts and minds and preferences of the target audience, whether it's towards a product, a politician, an idea, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Marie, you were saying? Uh, Ed, jumping in lang um, on that. So again, it's a very powerful tool, but I, I think um, its power lies in when people are not aware of the fact that it could be misused. So it's really very important that people become aware of that and then push back at the platforms when needed if if there's really malign algorithms that are that are ano, that are being ano, being kind of biased for for ano, for which biased for certain ano, malign uh, malign ano to, malign purposes like disinformation or hate diba? so so it's two things, and what it calls for really is a different type of in the in the case of elections, a different kind of vote watching. No, yes. it's not ano, it's not enough anymore to just watch the vote, like uh, like watch if it's being counted. Because the fact is, the vote, the vote is being manufactured already in the in the in the space of social media. The the sentiment, um, that is all being seed, uh, being uh, um, stoked. Uh, a particular sentiment is being stoked, and um, that the uh, that uh, the narratives are being seeded. Um, that's all um, connecting already to the outcome. So even if you watch at that end stage, yung the actual voting, that's too late if you're not monitoring in a more sophisticated way. So this is really important. Now, as we develop this, as these sophisticated tools are introduced, and they are tools. The public and and people of of, of yung mga, mga citizens jur, journalists we need to be more conscious of that and we need to be watchful and and watchful in a different way we need to be more sophisticated in monitoring this space. Mm -hmm. Some very good points, sir. Huh? Uh, awareness being so key, because like it or not, when you go on Facebook, when you go on social media, parang. Uh, I'm just here to read and to interact and engage. We, just, we don't know how our data is being used and we don't know how it's being pushed back to us and how it's affecting us. So it goes back to in, in sentiment, eh? sentiment analysis. Eh? Uh, some people, I suppose, a lot of people, I suppose, uh, tend to go with the flow, tend to go with the bandwagon. So if they, they, they notice a trend, they, they end up jumping on the trend and going with the flow. And that could be manipulated. Uh, Din Army, uh, I think you were trying to say something, uh -huh. Nicarina. Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, we have to develop a voters' literacy, you know, type of program. If uh, if we have media literacy, okay, information literacy, perhaps uh, it has to be uh, fine-tuned to voters' literacy and also uh, include digital citizenship. Because uh, actually, you know, like as you said, we jump into trends, etc. With not really knowing what we are getting into, and also not really understanding like uh, how we are being used, diba? So uh, I think we, um, we should uh, develop that uh, aspect for voters' literacy. And not only during elections, it has to be a whole program with or without elections. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much to everybody on our panel. To end our Q&A session, we will be asking each of you to give your parting words. We will give you a moment to think about your parting words as we flash our Zoom panel evaluation poll on the screen. Yes, po, meron tayong Zoom panel evaluation form. For those of you who are on Zoom, uh, kayo po yung nito. For those of you are on Facebook or uh, or YouTube, I'm, uh, I'm afraid you will not be able to see this. Uh, just a quick run through lang po. Five questions, please answer them. The panel Number one, the panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge of the topic. Uh, so... Please vote. Uh, strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. Number two, second, uh, second question. The panelists uh, were well prepared and organized. Strongly agree, uh, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. The panelists, number, I'm sorry, number three. The panelists spoke clearly and audibly. Again, the same choices. Strongly agree, going down to strongly disagree. Uh, second to last question, panelists used appropriate language with technical jargon adequately explained. Again, choices from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And the last question, the panelists contributed to the perspectives and the knowledge on data and sentiment 
analysis. Also one choice from uh, strongly agree down to strongly disagree. So please take this moment to answer a, this quick poll uh, to show our panel our great appreciation for their time and their, and their energy and their efforts. They've graciously taken the time from their very hectic schedules to be with us today. So we will leave this poll open so you can continue keying in your answers. Again, Paul, hindi siya right minus wrong, so do not be afraid to uh, put in, to plug in your answers as we proceed, proceed for our program, with our program. Now for the parting words, we begin with Dean Army Santiago uh, of uh, the College of Mass Communications. Dean Army. Yes, um, so we, you know, um, na, na ilatag na po sa atin, no, ang mga dapat natin maunawaan, okay, and uh, our experts really um, discuss thoroughly, okay, aspects that uh, are important and perhaps later you can communicate with them directly if there are more things that you have to say. But what is most important is we have to be diligent, diligent voters, and uh, we should, uh, we should, Use our intellect, you no, know, not not being uh, how do you say swept by the by the you know the stream, the strong stream of whatever sentiment that we have. That's all. Okay, thank you, Dinarmi. Uh, Andy Masigan, uh, Andy, I, I know you uh, you wanted to talk at greater length about uh, the platforms of the candidates. Uh, now, don't worry, we will have that uh, in in subsequent uh, fora. But uh, but for now, uh, can you give us your final words? Sure, no problem. There'll be another time for that. Um, I just want to let the listeners know or be aware that there are puppet masters behind every uh, digital campaign, and these are uh, be aware that this is an orchestrated effort, uh, which has which have been planned for a long, long period of time. So uh, be judicious and be diligent. Do your homework. Um, again, I, I refer to the platforms because this is the basis of leadership of the candidates. Please yes. take the time to please take the time to uh, to study them because at the end of the day, that's what the candidates have to offer. Thank you. Wag po pa Facebook, Facebook lang. Okay, Gemma, Gemma, Bagayawa Mendoza. So, um, my message is first of all, um. To make, ano, to make um, informed choices, we need to have reliable sources of information. No? Um, and, um, and currently, um, because, of, um, because of the fact that um, the platforms and data, big data, um, and, and social media has been abused, um, there's a whole, I mean, they, uh, it's difficult to make uh, for for most people to make informed decisions. So it's really important to be looking at this platform, watching this these platforms because of their potential impact on the elections. Recently, we've launched a, a campaign, um, a, a collaboration, uh, Facts First PH, working with multiple uh, sectors, um, media. Uh, I mean, fact checkers, um, researchers, uh, legal professionals. And um and civil society groups um so that um uh information verified and credible information verified information and credible information sources will be amplified, and that um fact checks themselves will be amplified. So it's really important moving into the election. So please um, be watchful. Mm -hmm. Okay, of course uh, we have Professor Dindaman Hit, uh, sir. Thanks, Ed. For everyone, uh, thank you for this opportunity for the organizers. But I just would like to emphasize one fact. Since 2016, we've had a, what I call a pandemic of misinformation or disinformation. And as we enter the election season on second day today, keep in mind that social media that has been an important tool for us to communicate to our friends, to our networks, have been weaponized. To, to disinform, I even would like to use, to hack our minds. We in this forum might have that capacity not to be influenced that way, but let's find a way to engage people and to stop the spread of this information because elections are very important. It shapes our future. It tells us the direction that we want. What if we make the wrong choices because we never understood there's nothing behind a certain candidate, as what Andrew was saying earlier about terms of platform. 
So it's time for us no, to take our part as active citizens. We have to stop this disinformation and shape really the election based on the substance of the candidate, on all the candidates. Thank you again for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, D Professor Dindo. So yun nga, uh, don't let Facebook do the choosing for you. <laughs> Be more active about it. So thank you very much to all our speakers. I know this is a very hectic season for all of you. We appreciate what, that you have shared your wisdom and your time for our webinar today. You are now sharing the evaluation poll results. And as expected, ito po. As expected, a uh, uh, great percentage of our viewers have given very high marks for our panel. Uh, I'll go to them, huh? Uh, question number one, panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge of the topic. Uh, strongly agree, 75%. Agree, 24%. So, so I don't. Uh, number two, the panelists were well-prepared and organized. 71% uh, strongly agree, 27% agree. Don't worry, wala namang strongly disagree or disagree. <laughs> number three, uh, the panelists spoke clearly and audibly. Ako lang siguro ang hindi. Strongly agree, 73%. And agree is 27%. And number four, panelists use appropriate language with technical jargon adequately explained. 68% strongly agree, 32% agree. And then the last question, panelists contributed to the perspectives and knowledge on data and sentiment analysis. 74% strongly agree and 25% agree. So there, uh, very good numbers for today's poll. Um, and uh, we're also launching our post-test Mentimeter Paul, uh, let's take a quick look at what it looks like. Uh, dalawa naman na tanong ito. Uh, uh, wait, let me, let me turn this down first. Okay. Uh, for the first question, what are the words that you associate with big data? Uh, number one pa rin is manipulation. Oh, number one is manipulation. Uh, well, I think more or less, pare -pare lang sizes eh. Manipulation, analytics, statistics, and data analysis. Uh, and possibly social media. So those are the words associated strongly with uh, the phrase big data. Now for the second question, malalaman ba ang kabuang sentimiento ng mga botante mula sa political surveys? 21 ang nagsasabing hindi. Isa ang oo. So yun po. Maraming pa rin talaga ang niniwalang hindi mo malalaman ang kabuang sentimiento ng mga botante mula sa mga political surveys lamang. I suppose that's, a, that's an important qualifier eh, dun sa lamang. Okay, we will keep the post-test open in the background as we proceed with our program. Now, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the Vice President for Public Affairs of the UP System and the President of the Philippines Communication Society. Please welcome Professor Elena Pernia. Hello. Hello, Ed. Hello to Dindo, to Gemma, Hi. to Andrew, and uh, Mom Army. Thank you for being here this, uh, you know, this uh, over lots for sharing your lunch hours with us. This episode of our national forum series on communication and democracy had our resource persons discuss how data and analytics may impact our 2022 Philippine elections. The webinar began with a definition of terms data analysis, data analytics, sentiments, sentiment analysis, sentiment anal analytics. Uh, there's some clarification of uh, their, dis their distinct differences where analysis pertains to the examination of gathered information uh, with the goal of discovering what are useful, informing conclusions, and supporting data decision-making. There is a science to analytics, analyzing raw data in order that conclusions may be made from this gathered information. Our moderator, Ed Lingao, then engaged a resource persons, Professor Dindo Manhit, economist and political analyst, uh, Andrew Masigan, and multimedia journalist, Gemma Mendoza, in a roundtable discussion that tackled such a wide variety of topics from surveys, data analytics, social media, campaign messaging, political analysts, influencers, candidates' platforms. I will do my very best to synthesize their main points. But my strong advice to all of you is to review the entire episode, which will remain in the TVUP YouTube channel. 
what is the value of data, whether these are gathered by quantitative or qualitative methods for elections. All, all candidates use survey data as these are necessary to craft a voter-centered campaign. Without a doubt, surveys conducted in a scientific manner produce accurate data capable of giving a snapshot of current opinions and even projecting trends in opinions across a variety of demographic groups. But there are doubts and questions about their validity and their utility. Surveys and big data can provide a glimpse into what people are thinking and feeling about the candidates. Hence, this data can be useful for both the candidates and the voters as they give us an impression you know, of what they can be and what they might be in the future. However, while these data are useful, we should all be cautious in interpreting and using these information. Some surveys are questionable because of their design, particularly the way questions are asked and also uh, the way that the respondents are sampled. The same caution must be made about using sentiment analysis because the opinions of those who did not post sentiments are not accounted for. So what is really the big picture? is in question. Sentiments have a social cultural di dimension. For example, if you look at patriotism as a sentiment and sentiment analysis uses the mechanical processes and algorithms to make sense of what are being posted. Again, these are useful for making projections and creating messages. But then as our opening speaker pointed out, these projections can change in a breeze. Opinions, especially during election campaign periods, may likewise change. Sentiment analysis offers data for real time election monitoring and prediction. What sentiment analysis does is to mine public posts and to sort them into positive and negative, and there lies their utility. Sentiments, that are put in the digital space have been increasingly showing importance as research indicates large numbers of the adult population get their political news and information from these large spectrum of social media pages where there is no gatekeeping of news and information. It seems that the legitimate newsrooms, the pages of news groups, have been drowned out. The digital space has brought on a lot of change. The election campaign battle is in fact in this digital space. Mining the data in this digital space allows niched micro-marketing, micro-targeting of the key demographics in political campaigns. These allow for giving information on who and where the voters are and what their specific needs and preferences are. Uh, as pointed out by our uh, esteemed Professor Manhit, in the case of Philippine elections, the key demographic is the economic class D. Without a doubt, the digital space, the social media are valuable because uh, it is in this digital space that we are able to measure precisely because they are digital it is it, we are able to measure information and sentiments there this according to our multimedia journalist Gemma Mendoza on the optimistic side the social media platforms are liberalizing tools and alternative communication media for empowering citizens for and in fact can strengthen democracy by echoing public opinion but as our economist and political analyst, Andrew Masigan points out, data analytics can be a boon and a bane. Data analytics can be frightfully accurate. The boon is you do get a, an accurate picture of what's out there, but on the negative side, using the data allows for a constructed reality. Data analytics can be used and abused. 
with half-truths and lies. Theatrics, sentiments, ratings, social media noise is just one aspect of the elections. What is important and valuable for democracy is the written word, the substance, the plans, and the platforms of the candidates. But, but uh, these again are drowned out because some campaign messages and narratives are, are, are the ones that are floating. These narratives, which do not pass the standards of the media, circumvent the editorial processes by finding life in the social media platforms. Hence, it has become exasperating that the platforms of these candidates and other substantial leadership issues do not get the proper exposure. Will we ever have, can we expect an elevation of, the, of Philippine election discourse? Well, the main lesson is uh, the ball is with us. It is incumbent on us, the voting public, to do our due diligence about the candidates, to dig for the truth. An enlightened citizenry is, a, is the key to democracy. And hence, there is an in, unquestionable need to develop voters' literacy, not only during this time of election, but all, at all times, and especially if they are integrated into our formal and non-formal education. As a parting shot, I'd like to address our audience, whether you are young or not so young. It bears repeating that your vote, our vote, is a decision on our collective future. Why? Because the persons we give our vote to will have a huge impact on six years of our lives. Six years truly is a long time. So please take the advice of our resource persons to go to see beyond the theatrics and the sentiments. Be aware, go to reliable sources of information. Do not fall for constructed realities. Learn to recognize misinformation and disinformation. Do your fact checking. Importantly, be active. Engage with others to stop the disinformation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that your afternoon was truly enlightened. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat po, Professor Nenny Pernia. Be active, not, pa not passive, and do your own fact-checking. Some things to keep in mind. For that concise and on-point synthesis, maraming salamat po, Professor Pernia. We are now sharing the post-test results, uh, the post -test results for our viewers. Uh, ito na po yung, I think, ang final na uh, resulta. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think the biggest word there or phrase there is delete Facebook. <laughs> I didn't see that a while ago. Anyway, it seems to be the biggest uh, word or phrase there so that, that garnered the most number of votes from our viewers. The others are of course uh, statistics, anal analytics, social media, data analysis, and analysis. Pero parang number one yung delete Facebook. And the second question, Okay, malalaman ba ang kabuang sentimento ng abotante mula sa mga political service lamang? 20p say hindi at isa po saying oo. As you can see on your screens, uh, there is a distinct increase in knowledge and understanding of the issues based on the post-test results. Those who have actively participated will get the most of this interactive program. Now, as we mentioned earlier, this webinar is part of the series on the, of the National Forum on Communication and Democracy, Philippine Elections 2022. The PCS will be having a webinar every second Wednesday of the month until May 2022 or election month. So do please do mark your calendars. Next month, we'll be featuring Keeping in Check the Power of Technology Giants with Robbie Lampai as your host and moderator. So please stay tuned for more updates on the PCS website or on the PCS Facebook page. So please save the date.
Now, if you would like to watch this or all the other previous webinars in playback, all the webinars in this series will be available for viewing at your convenience at the TV UP YouTube channel. So anytime, anywhere, you can access the previous webinars. Now, this formally brings to a close the seventh National Forum on Communication and Democracy, Philippine Elections 2022. We do look forward to your company again every second Wednesday of the month from 12 noon to 2 p.m. Manila time. This is Ed Lingao from TV5 on behalf of the Philippines Communication Society. Let us strengthen our country's democratic foundations through communications. So please do enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.